Hi, I'm Gary David. And I'm Adam Gamwell. Welcome to Experience by Design, the podcast where we explore experience designs of all kinds. There's a funny thing about technology that pervades throughout our life today. And that's that it makes it feel like we're constantly connected. But the truth of the matter is, in many ways, we have never been more disconnected from one another. These same devices, the same technology that can bring the world to our fingertips can, at the same time, drive a pretty significant barrier in between real moments of authentic connection. In many ways, this technology and this process of being divorced from connection divorces us from ourselves regarding our true human nature, who we are as human beings. Because after all, we not only crave connection or want connection, but in many ways, we fundamentally need connection as part of our, not just psychology, but biology. While Maslow, Abraham Maslow, you might have heard of him, put love and belonging in the middle of his pyramid, we could easily argue that it should be at the top. And if we don't put it at the top, we can say at least without feelings of belonging and without feelings of connection, can we ever truly be ourselves? Can we be a person without the company of others who make us that person. And so for experience designers, we should really be wondering, how can we create experiences that provide for connection and belonging? So much of experience design, so much of experience design areas is focused on the individual, is focused on what a person experiences. But as social scientists, we know and have long recognized that there's a fundamental need for connection and that the social is important. We also know, though, in a society like the United States, we really do seem to prioritize the individual, making us forget that we can't have an individual without a social. The trick then is how might we turn spaces into conduits for connection and belonging? Or, in other words, how do we or how might we reverse the ongoing atomization of our lives? I like the atomization. It was a, it was a jump over to Adam. Adam. Of talking. Yeah. Not atomization. Sense, atomization. Atomization. <laughs> A-T-O-M. Right. Yes. That. Um, but it's, it's a good point. You know, the individual and the social in, in spaces and events are key areas in which we're able to do that and kind of see this interaction between me and the we and the flow between the two. And so today in the experience design studio, we are excited to have the honor of delving into this area of event planning and the idea of harnessing serendipity around these moments of being together and building connections with our special guest, David Adler, CEO of BizBash. And throughout our conversation, we're going to be diving into details of things like soft powers of connections, collaboration, and emotional contagion of how do we feel alongside with others, not in a pandemic sense, but hopefully in a, a positive sense. Uh, and we'll be exploring how David's insights can help us create new opportunities and possibilities that might otherwise not exist. And this is actually one of the the really interesting parts that as you're opening us up, Gary, to think about that in who I can be as an individual is built in kind of special and serendipitous ways by interacting with others in certain spaces and events. And so this is a kind of a fun way we can think about kind of like social physics of how we can make this happen. Now, David's also going to help us understand uh, different ways to move into this because he's a pioneer in understanding the power of collaboration artists, which is a term that he writes about, and how they can generate unique ideas and solutions while also mobilizing diverse networks towards common goals. So bringing people together. We're also going to be exploring his thoughts on how do we foster collaboration and innovation across different ways and organizations and events and spaces, intergenerational interactions, and of course, the impact of technology on our social connections. Oh yeah. And also how we can have a good Jeffersonian dinner party. What is one of those? Right? That, that's what I'm saying. I learned about them in this episode, and so some of you listeners might also be doing the same thing. And it's they're actually quite interesting. So this is a great conversation that we can't wait to share with you. So sit back, relax, or if you're running, keep running. Um, put your tray tables in upright position and get ready to explore the art of experience design with our guest, David Adler. Mm-hmm. 
I was um, I was at an event recently, and it made me think of you, David, because there it was a large uh, chamber of commerce event, and there was a reception or a cocktail hour ahead of time before the main event started, and there was a strong lack of tables to stand at, <laughs> and I, you know, for people like me who were new to this event, you saw a lot of people kind of standing around, not knowing where to anchor themselves. And I luckily found a table that was unoccupied, which really a tables are these events are connector, you know, devices because people stand at tables and they put their drinks on them and they meet one another. But I think as I was talking about it with another person, they had a lack of tables. And I was thinking, how might this event be different in terms of making connections with people if we only had more tables? Oh, I think that the 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 shape of the room, uh, <laughs> the where the chairs are. The whole physical setup is unbelievable. I was just at a, an event just this morning uh, where I complimented them because they did the circles as opposed to, you know, the the old-fashioned uh, amphitheater style, uh, which is, you know, it hasn't changed since the dawn of time. And uh, you see more and more tables at events where people sit circularly and they 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 are able to look into each other into their eyes. And I think that people are nervous when they go into a party. There's a sense of or an event of any sort. You have to feel safe. And when you walk into a room that there is no um, sort of like way that somebody's helping you, uh, it it's really bad. That's why I I believe in bringing back the reception line, receiving line. And okay. I try to I try to even though some people think that's old fashioned. I think people want to be welcomed. I mean, I even do that at the coat check line. When there's a long coat check line, I go and I introduce myself to everyone on the coat check check line. And it and it you have to de- start developing, you know, to make people want to connect. They have to be trusting the place that they're at. You, you, might, you talk about being welcome. The event when I walked into the there was a lot of you know these roller bars set up right where where bartenders were serving drinks. And there was one that was closest when I walked in, I walked up to it to get a water and the bartender was standing in front of it. And I went to go get a water and he's like, I'm sorry, this is closed. <laughs> I'm like, what? what? I'm like, what? Hmm. And he's like, yeah, you have to go to the one all the way down there. That, that one's open. I'm thinking, then why are you standing here in front of this bar? <laughs> and that's the, the first thing I get walking into this thing is admonished. And he was nice enough about it, but still, no, no, I was denied service the very first thing that happened. I'm like, I don't think this is the way you want this to start. Well, do you know Richard Addius, who is one of these incredible empresarios who I wrote about in the book, who did, did World Economic Forum and all that kind of stuff, says you can have the greatest substance in your event and you can you know, have the greatest speakers. But if they screw up the transfers and the entrance and that it puts a, such a sour taste in your mouth that it takes a long time to build up the trust, even in the moment that you're getting goosebumps because the, sur- the program is so great. Mm. We've all no, it makes that. It makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. it's like forgiveness will go. It's it's harder to come by than than to to get it right in the first place. Yeah, so you know? get it. So get it right and think about it. like everyone ignores these details, which are the details of soft power. You know, soft power is now um, came out of the closet. That people really, you know, the idea of having a conversation at an event and creating serendipity, like, oh, my God, you have that idea. Oh, my God, what a great idea. Let's connect. Let's go to lunch. And I always say that the most important word in the English language is the word let's because it's the biggest activation word. Let's go to lunch. Mm-hmm. Let's go to dinner. Let's hook up. Let's uh, let's uh, start a revolution. It's just amazing <laughs> how a little thoughtfulness in this era of being a collaboration artist goes a long way. I like this idea too of soft power because as, as, as social scientists, as ethnographers that, that Gary and I um, trade in, the, you know, oftentimes we, we talk about the, the importance of soft skills, right? In terms of being able to communicate with somebody, you know, whether looking them in the eye or just understanding like what is somebody's comportment or bodily um, movement, you know, their, their nonverbal communication style also in, in addition to the words they're saying, um, you know, it's such an important part that uh, oftentimes, you know, in a hard science space will get overlooked. And then in a business setting, they can often get overlooked too. You know, that, that it's, it's not seen as like, well, what's the ROI of like paying attention to your customers or your, your employees, you know? 
Um, and so it's, I like this idea of soft power also as a kind of a, a, a corollary to that, that there are these, these elements. And I guess uh, thinking about how we might define that to, for, for listeners is thinking about uh, is, is, do you see it as kind of soft power because they're not measurable in the same way as that would be as hard uh, power? Not, the opposite? Well, I guess not, I'm kind of thinking about that. Yeah. Uh, yes and no. I mean, the soft power is, you know, if, how do you measure feelings? Right. It's really, really hard. But how much impact do we have? How much blink analysis do we do based on feelings and things like that? And But some mm. power is like, for example, when I was working at the State Department as a voluntold, my friend became the chief of protocol, we talked about moving the antiques around when you have a visiting dignitary so that the conversation is more relevant. So, you know, it's mm. how do you connect in different ways uh, soft power to me is judging an event not by how many people attend, but how many conversations you're able to curate at that event mm. and by allowing people to talk to each other. So while it's hard to measure, the that's why it's called collaboration artist. Mm. Uh, it is it is a lot of the soft stuff. But then, you know, the book Social Physics by Alex Pentland, it's mm. a great book on um, how ideas flow. And if you think about the way the book works, you know, even viruses work the same way. And uh, he does he does a lot of sort of nonverbal stuff on how the person who is leading the meeting or the event doesn't talk as much as the people at the event. And that, you know, it's all about an energy and enthusiasm. And he does a lot of data science based on watching human behavior as opposed to just um, data. There was an event I was in charge. I was a president of an association, an academic association. And we traditionally had a breakfast plenary where people would come in and listen to a speaker. And I said, you know, no, no one likes the breakfast plenary, probably let alone the speaker, because people are rolling in late. It's early in the morning. People aren't really paying attention. I said, let's just get rid of the speaker and have people in the room and put up signs at each table that designates a certain specialization. So if you work in that specialization, you can meet other people. Or if you're interested in that specialization, you can go meet people who do that kind of work and just let people talk to one another. We don't need to curate every moment. We can just create spaces for people to get to know one another, which goes to your book, Harness and Serendipity, right, is how to make those connections possible. You know, it's it's kind of also about scaling intimacy right? because people really want to connect and they, if they're sitting in watching just a big plenary session, uh, they don't really necessarily do that. For example, one of the things I do at all my speeches uh, is the first five minutes, I say, okay, talk to the people next to you instead of me, because it's not about me, it's about you. And I'm basically mm -hmm. creating like a thousand conversations in five minutes, and it gets to the let's, and they all read afterwards. And it, it just... It's it's just a thoughtful way of of making that audience, it's, you know, guys especially. Like I sometimes wouldn't have eye contact with the person next to me sitting in a theater or mm. something like that. And what the collaboration artist does on stage is give people permission to talk to each other. Mm. I mean, these are very simple things, but especially in the age of technology where everybody's on their phones, they run to their phone as a way to not have to talk to anybody. You know, the wor hardest thing in the world is putting your hand out and say, hello, my name is David Adler. I mean, that's like, you know, it's almost like the fear of public speaking that people have. And, mm. uh, but once they do it, they love it. And, uh, you know, the book is full of these stories of how, you know, I believe that anybody that's a collaboration artist also is in the goosebump business. That Because when people mm. do get that satisfaction of meeting one friend at an event or coming up with an idea that changes the world or, or, or a, solves a problem, there's this thing about celebration. Uh, I interviewed uh, Wynton Marsalis, who mm. is a jazz musician, sure. and he talks about this thing after they do an improv, everyone hugs each other. Because it is a sign of respect. And it's kind of like when you do have a conversation, it's kind of a way to recognize that, oh, my God, that was really successful. Because isn't the best thing when you meet somebody, you can have all the business success in the world, but people still want those personal interactions and they want to make friends. Um, another woman who's 100 years old runs a, a place, a spa called Rancho La Puerta. And her thing is, 
that um, people just want to have friends. So she, every dinner they have at the place, they move people around to a different table. So it forces everyone to interact and everyone has to introduce themselves. And you never know where the oxytocin exchange is going to result mm. in somebody connecting in a way that changes their lives. We talk about love, right? You know, the, that movie about uh, that where the door opens in the subway and the subway closes and you potentially miss the spouse that you're going to marry, oh, right. you know, that type of stuff. You just never, you just never know. So you got to be open to all the possibilities. And I think in learning, it's the same way. And in, in friendship, it's the same way. And I solving problems is the same way. And when people are in a um, collaborative situation, even at work, having a good meeting, uh, makes it worthwhile having a bad meeting really sucks when the guy is just talking the whole time and we're all rolling our eyes at everything mm. so it, it's you know it's very human naturey the stuff that i'm talking about and the reason i wrote the book is because so many people suck at this <laughs> and it's not that hard yeah. yeah i mean do you think it's that is it something that we because it, it's funny yeah because part of it is like they're they're a, you know, we're social creatures as humans and that when we crave this kind of, this, this kind of collaboration and, and partner building. Right. Uh, so I guess what are some of the elements, if we kind of flip it for a second, like that have made it harder for us or that made us forget that there's something that we're, that we're good at this. Is it traditional kind of social structures and, and, you know, business speak that made us that way? Are we educated out of it? Like what, what have you kind of seen that like made it I, tough well, for us I to think get there? So we, we're not. Um, the structures are different. Uh, many of us learn some of these things for good or for bad in religious uh, mm. uh, context and others in sport and mm. the organized sport world. You know, what is sportsmanship? But uh, basically an unbelievable collaboration and we're not respecting mm. any of that. I think internet has made everything one-to-one, -one, but but without with your head down and no eye contact. Uh, mm -hmm. so that you're willing to say anything and you're not, there's no results. Um, and, and, and I think that it's, um, it's, we're out of practice at it. And I think a lot of people don't even understand any social skills, uh, or any social protocols, how many, uh, you know, the idea, I think this is actually a good thing that the, the next newer generation is, is saying, screw you to power or screw you to the boss and saying what they really think. Mm. I mean, I think that's really refreshing, but sometimes they get beaten down for it and things like that. So people are afraid to do it. I think there's a, there's a lack of intergenerational conversations mm. uh, that there is a lot of built in, I guess, prejudice from, you know, age. Uh, and um, I think that's the new frontier because I think we're getting mm. a little better at diversity, but I think there there is still a little issue with um, <clears throat> what learning. You know, I like to learn from young people. I mean, I learn more. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of young friends. I mean, I actually went because I'll have no one to come to my funeral <laughs> if I don't have any young friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you got to keep intergenerationally learning and and using these skills and being social. I think is an important part of life. Now, it's you got to also plan for introverts. There are a lot of introverts. Mm -hmm. So introverts need help. They need to be um, told what to do and they need, to, they, you know, every, but now most of us are like introverted in one way because we don't know. But when you go into a party or go into an event, it, it's scary. We don't feel safe. And so safety mm -hmm. is the number one thing when you do a, uh, I do these Jeffersonian dinner parties and uh, I don't know if you've heard about those, but there are, yeah. it's just a way of connecting a room uh, and controlling the conversation. You know, when you go to a dinner party and the person at one end of the table never talks to the person at the other end of the table because everyone's doing mm. their own conversation. I like to make it so I control the conversation in the room. So you have 12 mm -hmm. people and the way I like to do it, it starts with, the concept of me, something about me, then we, then us. So basically, and then and then sort of a go around. So I start with a question that has been really successful because I'm not that intellectual. I go with a more um, uh, easier question like, what was your first job and what did you learn from it? And all of a sudden, mm. you've democratized the room and anybody that's feeling a little nervous also saw the other person was a babysitter or worked at Baskin Robbins or milk cows for their family farm. Mm. 
and <laughs> and then and then you create more questions on like where what are we what are our problems what are our pain points and then what can we do about it and whether it's solving a problem or whatever because people like to have, I mean you can have fun social events and not do any of this but if you want to be productive and have high performance collaboration you have to control the the conversation just like when you're a teacher you have to create some sort of structure for the room to learn and there's no difference mm. i just did a um i am a i did a chat g b t g t b g p t um, g p t g p t on icebreakers and so i said give me a hundred icebreakers that people are using around the world and it came up with an amazing list of icebreakers and then i said give me all the icebreakers that nursery school teachers use and it came up with a lot of the same icebreakers. <laughs> uh, and then I did give me a CT, give me a uh, icebreaker on what military, what, what, what do they do in the military? And it was very similar. And then all of it's the same. Like we, we don't change. We just want to connect. We want to be intimate mm. with each other and we want to, you know, be able to connect in real ways. And, and, the, and, and so that's one area. The other area that I see that's changing. This is a, going back to your what's wrong. What is that we now are in an era that we believe in parasocial relationships. Right. It's a relationship mm. with a fictional character. You guys know what that is. Right. And 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 we're more we're more intimately involved in the sex life of Donald Trump than our best friends. I'd rather not be, honestly. Oh, absolutely. No, no. <laughs> but but, yeah. from, uh, but, you but know, his, I mentioned. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But his his world is that Kim Kardashians and all that, and these influencers are taking over the you know becoming parasocial relationships. We have parasocial relationships with events, like when you go to uh, South by, you think you're hipper. When you go to a World Economic Forum, you think mm -hmm. you're like uh, Hoity Toisy. When you go to um, TED, you think you're smarter, and and you have this relationship with these fictional characters. The same we have with our brands. Like I'm an Apple person, so I like Apple, you know, and I think, oh my god, I'm so cool i like apple but well, then i went I, to south by i did not feel cooler i felt less cool because everyone else seemed more cool than me oh well that's so for true me, it had <laughs> the true. reverse that's effect true. because that's i was true. like wow i knew i was not cool coming into this and now <laughs> i know by how much there was a definite benchmark that i could place myself against for my lack of coolness at South by. well that becomes yeah there are two sides of every story <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> well it kind of reminds me you know i was thinking about this you know, the idea of connection and social media. And I talk about sociology, I'm a sociologist as a science of connection and belonging. I was just looking up the word um, commune, not commune, but commune as a verb, right? And then you think, and it's like having this close spiritual connection or relationship with, and then we think about communion or community or communicate. And I've never actually made that connection with the you know, the, the origins of the word, but it really does speak to what you're talking about that we, you know, social media might be social, but it's not communal media. It doesn't facilitate connection in that way that we often talk about happening in other kinds of uh, environments where we are sh able to share something that is intimate with one another. Yeah, I have in the book a, neuro, uh, a sort of a neuroscience expert that talks about emotional contagion that happens when you walk into a room because you have that magnetic, magnetic field that actually connects you in different ways and the oxytocin exchanges and things like that that are not just about, you know, moms and kids, but about everybody in the room. And uh, but I, but a lot of the people that I know in the uh, AI digital world are waiting for the day when that can happen via hologram or whatever i don't think it'll ever happen but meta you know, they, meta's not going to be it we're not going to put vr I, goggles on and, have you uh, done that yet have you done I that have. Yet? yeah it's not great it's not great i mean it's, <laughs> it's 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 like once you sort of do the batting of the light thing you know it gets old in about five <laughs> minutes and and i definitely think that that that's going to be a problem but i think that ai i think that that kind of um spatial technology will impact in live events in different ways when you go hmm. to an event and it's not as cumbersome. And I'm curious to see how this Apple, new Apple um, glasses type of thing works because maybe they've cracked the code on it. Who knows? I mean, things are moving so fast that you never know. But the face-to-face -face handshakes and things like that, 
But I mean, I still think that the, we're having a conversation now. I think the intimacy of the Zoom conversations and the and the uh, podcasting is amazing. I think podcasting is intimacy, and, and because you're 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 hearing uh, really. I mean, when I listen to a podcast every single week on somebody, I get to know them. I mean, mm. I I uh, listen to Kara Swisher and. Every week, and I get up early to watch them because I think they're my friend. There's sort of a parallel social relationship with yeah. them, and and you end up becoming intimately involved in the lives of those people. If you're a podcast, I do a podcast, and people, you know, the you may not. It's a it's a very big market, but those thousand people that do listen really like it because it connects directly to them. And how do you mm. be relevant in people's lives? Yeah, no, it's it's funny too because we were even thinking about this the other the other day that. Uh, it's it's funny too that like in the era of of AI and, and all these new fangled technologies that are that are purporting to change the way that we interact with each other, uh, the emergence and rise of podcasting over the past fifteen years has like just reminded us that there's there is this intimacy of just having somebody literally in your skull, right? Just hearing yeah. their voice yeah. uh, that yeah. cannot be replicated by um, being in a three D space playing Beat Saber with somebody, right? Um, oh, yeah. And that's, that's, that's really interesting. Beat saver. <laughs> <laughs> Hitting lights. I was like, okay, yeah, beat saver, you know, yeah, you got it. <laughs> um, but, but totally right. You know, it's like, there's, I think there's something powerful that reminds us of the, the, what's, what's really in our DNA, you know, and it's, and we are kind of primed to connect. And so as, as uh, distracting and or enthralling as YouTube is uh, like, there's something that's special about being able to just listen to somebody as if you're having a conversation with them. Um, and I think it's, it's why podcasting has survived, um, in the era of the rise of video, but then also it continues to thrive because it's, we actually do to your point. I think you're right. Like we, we, we're craving that connection and podcasting affords us a, a way of doing that. Um, that, you know, took the intimacy of public radio or talk radio, uh, to a whole new level. Cause I can, I can listen to my own conversations when I want to, um, I can follow Kara Swisher, you know, I can follow my, my favorite host. And I think there's something really interesting about that, that, I also think I'm thinking out loud here that uh, spurns on the like parasocial relationship aspect too, because I can like now listen to my friend when I want to um, versus they call me up, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, it's, there's something very powerful about the voice. It, 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 and, and I'd rather listen to them on radio than um, like listen to them in my ears rather than watch the video. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, but the thing is, I think podcasting, I'm surprised that it, it had a little bit of a stumble because uh, podcasting used to be the race for the car and mm -hmm. the pandemic kind of slowed that down and it got people to sort of use it for other things, um, yeah. which was good. And I think the pandemic, again, connected us in different ways where you got so intimate with your little pod too. Uh, and you became dependent upon that. And now people, there's a little bit of a, of a thirst to gather, but I think uh, it may wane a bit. Uh, as people get over the fact that they have to go travel places and it's a big pain in the ass to get places and things like that. Uh, you have to really go where you want to go. I think there's going to be much more discrimination in who you want to communicate with and who mm. you want to connect with. And you want to make sure that you're not being wait your time's not being wasted. That's why being a collaboration artist is more important than ever because you go to the cocktail party like Gary went to and you want to kill yourself. You know, if if it's just a terrible experience, um, but if you went to another one where they were warm and welcoming, and you had a uh, you know uh, an experience that was transformational, uh, maybe you'd go again to something. One of the things, as you we were talking, makes me think about a philosopher named John Rawls, who talked about a veil of ignorance, right? And how would we set up society to be just if we knew nothing about ourselves in terms of what categories we belong to and what you know, um, privileges that category provided. So if I didn't know that my white privilege or male privilege provided me with certain privileges, what would I set up as a just society? And it makes me think about trying to make these connections, right? How would we orient to one another in the absence of social identities that create barriers and boundaries and fault lines between us? And I think one of the things about your, your icebreaker questions is not just what it asks, but what it avoids asking. So that it creates that possibility for a connection that doesn't get stuck in so many of the fault lines that seem to be surfacing through social media 
um, which will completely stop any possibility of serendipity once they surface. Right. When we find out what 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 bonds us a little bit more than what divides us. You know, exactly. Thing, it, mm. it makes a big difference. Um, but commonalities, you know, it's interesting. I'm about to launch something on global sportsmanship. Because if we teach kids about better sportsmanship and fans about sportsmanship, it 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 it, it you know, there's this big argument about being a global citizen. People don't want to be that. But there's certain ethical things about being a good sportsman that cross right. all those boundaries, and you can talk about it in ways that you can't talk about the 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 red herring word of a global citizen, you know, which I believe I want to be. But you know, you're you're getting into fault lines. I don't know. Do you follow? You must because everyone does. Do you follow uh, Indian Premier League cricket at all? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I say it jokingly. They actually have a fair play award. Because I follow cricket. I watch India Premier League cricket. Interesting. And, and it says, I'm just reading here, uh, the IPL Fair Play Award is given to a team that plays in the right spirit of the game and shows sportsmanship the best throughout the season. The award is bestowed as a symbol of appreciation to the oh. team that shows how cricket should be played in the widely discussed spirit of the game. And then they have various criteria for it. So it was like one of the that. only sports events that I know professional sports leagues actually has a sportsmanship award. I mean, hockey does hockey has the um, I'm blanking on the name right now, the lady Bing, which is for sportsmanship, but yeah, the whole league that's given to a team and they have standings about who's at the top of the sportsmanship award. That is really, you know, you're giving me a great idea for this program that I'm about to start that rec I think recognition is one of the greatest tools to connect people and a sportsmanship, a global, like a global sportsmanship award for the, from the State Department would be an interesting thing to give to fans, too, like to the fan groups as opposed to uh, – because mm. I think that we need to role model how people connect with each other. And you have to do it in ways that don't create these barriers of uh, – people's um that, that get people's back up just because the words may mean one thing to one person or another thing to someone else yeah mm -hmm. it, it, you know it's you, know, you think about hockey and even i don't know if you're familiar with the lady bing but that's you know let's read it here the national hockey league player a judge to have exhibited the best type of sportsmanship and gentlemanly conduct combined with high standard of playing ability that's, that's so for a league where people are beating each other with sticks and there's punching you know, they have an award for sportsmanship and, you know, the, the thing when I teach sociology of sports, that's why I'm kind of geeking out on this oh, idea. Wow. Yeah. Is, you know, at the end of the hockey, at the end of a playoff series in hockey, you always shake hands and it's like, yeah, it's big yeah. things. you shake hands and that's emblematic of sportsmanship and respect in hockey. That's no different than uh, Winton Marcellus after an improv, you know, mm. having everyone hug. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. I think I think it's fascinating because so often we think about sports as this, you know, you know all all the words we use, you know, battlefield, especially in football, it's layered with militaristic jargon. And mm. then at the end of the day, you know, being able to elevate sportsmanship as really the thing that should be gone after more important than wins. It's what we learn from actually participating that becomes the essence of sports. Yeah, no, I think that that, I think you're onto something really big because it's uh it's a way of teaching citizenship without, you know, since we don't have civics anymore, uh, right. it's a way of, t it's a way of at least making people behave <laughs> or at least respect, or at least um, be open to others. And I think that, you know, when you're in a collaboration situation, it's all about finding common ground. And that is an art. And even like the idea of art itself, you know, you have me thinking here that um, I worked with a, a, a public artist on a project a few years ago. Um, and they're, they were doing some projects that were designed around raising public conversations around uh, diversity and inclusion in, in Boston and the city. And, you know, one of the things that stood out to me is I was, I was thinking about how we might position some of the pieces and, and talk about them. Um, and she's like, well, one of the main things we have to keep in mind though, is that the point of this art and, and, you know, in her perspective to art in general is actually about public collaboration. You know, it's like the artist makes the piece, but it's like, what does it do for us together as we, as we consume, think about, and, and, you know, work around the piece um, with it. And that was something that has kind of always stood with me too, that, um, you know, if, if I, 
nonchalantly or didn't reflectively reflect on, you know, how I might consume a YouTube video or some content online. It's it again, I think your point, Dave, is this very one-on-one experience that we're seeing, but then the power of art, even though it's like me looking at a painting or a sculpture in a, in a museum, there's still something about the, the public interaction with it too. And the collaborative part of that with the artist and the, and the, uh, the participants. And so I, I think even this too, like the, the, the idea of, uh, for me thinking that the, like there's, I think an important analog here too, uh, from sport also, also over to art, um, as, as a collaborative enterprise too. And, and, and I think right about artists and, and art itself is an, an area in the book. And so I think that's like an interesting area also to, uh, to think with. Um, and I'm saying this too, because, uh, in, at least in my high school back in the day, I'm trying to think, you know, this is my like, you know, jets and sharks kind of thing where there was like the art, art kids and there was the sports kids. Right. And they didn't always, they had their camps. Right. <laughs> I think it's probably still the perennial for, for every, 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 uh, high school ad infinitum. Um, but even this too, I think is, is like kind of noting where are the, the safe, the safe camps. I guess, I guess I'm thinking about this as I'm saying it, that like how these ways that we can kind of promote collaboration, uh, you know, it's important to recognize, I think that, that it can happen in so many different ways, right? Again, through sport, through art. Um, and so that, that there is options, I guess, do, do we think, do we see commonality between them? Like, um, in terms of is collaration the same across the spectrum? Um, does it happen differently? In, well, in collaboration yeah. is a, when I first started the book collaboration, the first person that I mentioned it to was how collaboration is a bad word. Because mm, they thought about what is going on with collaborating with the Nazis and the French mm. people and all of the negatives of collaboration, too. Uh, so it's not as, you know, cheery and peaceful as you mm. think, because <laughs> a lot of times people just want to survive and they call them collaborators. And that's a negative term. Hmm. Uh, so that's why I added collaboration artists, because I think it's soft. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very really interesting. interesting, though, right? I mean, you think about the, you know, the ways in which word meaning changes, you know, people collaborating at work just to survive, right? You know, or, you know, I teach students, I don't use group projects, but other faculty that do and students talk about working in teams and group projects, collaborating just to survive. Not that it's a great experience, but it's something we all have to suffer through. It's, I guess, it's an right. experience in the same way in boot camp is, right? It creates yeah. a bonding through suffering. Right. Yeah, no, it's a whole, it's got so many dimensions to it. You're 100% right. And, and, but the thing is, though, it's a technology and an art that could be used for good or bad. Right. Mm. So you have to measure it just like almost anything else. I and mean, we talk about AI being the end of the world, but it's also you know, for an entrepreneur, it's like like nirvana because all of a sudden somebody can spell better. I don't have to worry about spelling and grammar and everything else as much. <laughs> um, and uh, it uh, so there's so many different aspects of this. And it's very complex. I mean, the whole thing is really complex about it. But I think having this... Having the skill to be able to have a conversation with somebody right. is, and then say, oh, that's a good idea and not be, you know, let your ego say, I'm the only one that has an idea that's any good because we find that out a lot. And you, a lot of times you got to shut up the person that talks the most because mm -hmm. they're usually, you know, full of crap. It's yeah. a, I really love this because, you know, speaking for Adam, he's an anthropologist, I'm a sociologist, but we basically do is study how people form groups and establish belonging. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it's about, right? Yeah. And and I don't want to cry poor on the social sciences, but psychology is far more popular as a thing than either of our disciplines. And that's heavily individualistic and cognitivistic inside your head, which I think in many ways mirrors how we envision ourselves through culture as individuals, as individualistic, whereas our disciplines that focus on groups that focus on belonging that focuses on the, you know, the social kind of are ignored, but as you're established in the book and as you're talking about here, it's, it's the vital thing that is who we are. You know, we're homo socialis, we're social beings. We're, we're, yeah. we, we, we need this connection and in an absence of it, yeah. we suffer. We're not these yeah. rugged individuals that are, you know, right. are on horseback smoking Marlboros. Right. We're, we're, we, we crave that community. And we all do better. I mean, the collective knowledge seems to be working most of the time. Yeah. And, uh, and I, you guys are the experts on all this. All I know is that when is that 
the people that I call these collaboration artists, so to speak, quotes, air quotes here, um, are not taken seriously. And, I know the feeling. And I <laughs> like what I'm trying to do is say, OK, remember those days when this is purely public relations, I guess. Uh, those days when the chefs were in the back room and they were slinging hash and nobody cared who they were. Now they're superstars. Right. What I want to do is celebritize the collaboration artists. So when you walk into a climate conference and there's a person there that's the great organizer, that they get the respect that they need. So when they say something, it's thought of more uh, seriously. Unlike, unlike when the chef's food all, all of a sudden gets better when they're well-known. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Was that the motivation for BizBash was to kind of create a, a knowledge base for people who are in this industry to, to get best practices or inspire one another about how to create these you know, experiences of belonging? Yes, absolutely. When I, I, I got out of college, I started a society magazine in Washington, D.C. Oh. And I ended up, people thought I was um, a maitre d' because I was in black tie every night. And this is in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And I only ate things on toothpicks, you know. Um, and so I, what I would do, though, is I talked to all these senators, congressmen, and ambassadors. And the number one skill set was event organizing. That's what they lived and died on. They were gatherers of groups in some way to, the, tell, to tell their message. So when I was, I was at a big company, I ran corporate communications, and I ended up um, doing a million events. And there was no marketplace for events. So I decided, why don't I start a, um, start a media company that actually disintermediates the event organizer and says who did what at the event so that people can see experiences. And then what happened was it became a competition. We allowed people to peek over the fence to see what other people are doing. And then all of a sudden, everybody wanted to, I, I could do that better. Oh, that's a good idea. I could do that better. Let me try this. Let me try that. And, and the competition of ideas raised the bar. And so rec that's when I come back to recognition and I'm raising the level of what an event organizer is to a collaboration artist or an experience creator. And that to me is going to hopefully cause recognition that this is a big skill. Now, uh, experiential marketing is becoming the hottest thing going. And all of a sudden it's the center of event marketing budgets and not the nice to haves. And so if you can take these group creators and turn them into into you know pure uh, people that they are respected, then their messages are going to get heard more clearly. That makes sense. No, that's really interesting. Oh too. yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's and no, it's it's an interesting way, interesting angle to come at it from too. Because you're right. It's like we've seen the the rise of the experience economy, and then now the this is the thing that people people are focused on in terms of creating a better customer and and kind of participant experience. And the, um, the and then technologists it, like, yeah. are making millions of dollars for user experiences. We are programmers of human experience of human experiences. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And so people don't realize when uh, you read the book about um, uh, about Steve Jobs and how when he was planning his uh, new uh, office facility, he wanted to create a huge bathroom right in the middle to create serendipitous moments where people would run into each other. Of course, it got kiboshed because mm -hmm. you couldn't walk a mile to go to the bathroom. Um, uh, but but he was a brilliant collaboration artist as well. Mm -hmm. And you know he's got his good points and his bad points. But the smartest CEOs are the ones that you know spend hours working on the seating chart for who sits next to whom at their dinner parties. Because they, mm. that's where you create the let's, you know, the, uh, oh, let's do that business. Or let's do this business or let's buy this. or, or and, it, and we have a responsibility when you gather with other people to be as good of a guest as you are as a host. And that's the other thing that I think is part of the social physics of how ideas flow. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's because that, that makes me think about the this idea that you mentioned a little bit before that, like oftentimes when we're helping foster collaborative environments, if we lack training or or have just been lopsided for a while, like oftentimes we don't always listen to the other party, right? We're, we may not be a very gracious guest in that. In that. So in, in that perspective, like what are some tactics we could think about, you know, um, either ideas you cover in the book or other things you found in, in uh, the consulting projects of helping make sure that these moments of collaboration are equitable, right? So it's not just one party kind of taken over um, and that we can make sure that we are um, having this kind of true exchange back and forth. 
Uh, listening skills are really good. Uh, mm. I also think, in fact, this morning at the speech I gave uh, to a bunch of people that are being brought in to do tech, um, civic tech, they, they they pour them into different agencies and they say, come up with systems that will work. And, uh, and one of the things that I believe is that, you know, be generous with the idea that sparked being the other person's idea. And it makes mm. people feel more comfortable and because they're contributing it, you know, to they're contributing greatly because it's it's giving you the goosebumps or something and making you think about something else. And so, I mean, that's really good. Making people feel safe is still the most important thing you can do is mm -hmm. making people asking lots of questions, letting people like like talk that are introverts, um, knowing someone's name is unbelievable. Uh, you mm. know, it's hi, Adam. You know, making sure that they're being heard. Uh, mm. Everyone, when I do this Jeffersonian question, one uh, the one I other other one I ask is, who is your favorite teacher and why? Every single mm. one of them comes down to my third grade teacher who listened to me as a human being, mm. as opposed to a kid. <laughs> and and I found that, and that gives people the goosebumps, and they remember that teacher 50 years later and they have the lessons that they learn from that teacher come out whether the ceo of a company or you know a management guy or in retirement or whatever and all that through line happens early so that's why i think that the sportsmanship thinking and the idea of shaking hands and all of that as part of cultural ceremony is being forgotten and you know, protocol mm. is protocol for a reason. Uh, that a lot of it has to do with what's going on in the brain as well. You know, why does the person on the right sit next to you? Because they're evidently your ear on one side is stronger than the ear on the other side. Or uh, uh, then there's all sorts of things. That's so why in astrology, the woman that did that came up with your fire sign. I mean, is astrology is it is it a bunch of you know poppycock or is it? You know, a database for years and years of how people behave, mm -hmm. and uh, they're just accessing a database that um, we have not quite, you know, put into uh, Excel. Mm. I mean, that's what we should put on the name tags as well, is what the person's sign is, and yeah. not just their name. Yeah, well, I think because it's a big icebreaker. We do a lot of events where you go into a different entrance. If you like salty food, you go into one entrance. If you like uh, sweet food, you go into the other entrance. And your nerves awesome. are matched to the thing. Uh, my friend who runs the New Zealand Embassy uh, Cultural uh, uh, Attaché, when they do parties at their embassy, they cut the grass bef right before – uh, their events and they put on a barbecue so that it's you smell like you're in New Zealand and the cut grass smell evidently has a big impact in how people feel. Um, you know, people that serve warm drinks instead of cold drinks make people feel more comfortable. Do you know that smell of the chocolate chip cookie as you walk by the bakery? I mean, mm. that makes you feel, I mean, great. Uh, there's a good book by, um, by, um, uh, that's called Captivology uh, by Ben Parr, who talks about how if you're wearing your white uh, doctor suit as a scientist on stage, people will pay much more attention to you than if you don't. Hmm. And, and you know, he talks about uh, all these sort of techniques that people use to make people feel comfortable. Bill Clinton, well, he t he h puts your hand on your shoulder. Now, he right. got in trouble for that kind of stuff, but but the idea mm -hmm. that you feel like he's the only one in the room talking to you. So how that makes people feel comfortable and connect. Well, what's so the first thing's important here in this, I, you know, I used to have a colleague who unfortunately passed away who was very big in the area of service sciences. And you, know, you talked about soft skills, but there is a science behind this or soft power. There is a science and yeah. the idea of, you know, while we might not, we might know something makes us feel good, like Bill Clinton's hand on your shoulder, but we not, might not know why. But as we're doing more neuroimaging and fMRI scanning, we're trying to, we're starting to understand that there is a intersection between the, the cultural and the physiological that things that we know work culturally also have a physiological foundation and that by understanding those principles, you can engineer communal environments in which people can feel, can, can create easier connections. 
Totally. And you're the guys that are at the center of this kind of stuff. I mean, I if you can so. make it, if you can make it accessible right. and, and, and do what, you know, kind of like what chat GBT did to all of a sudden create like, Oh my God, you can use this. It's been going on for years, but all of a sudden they made it sort of easy to understand for everybody. Right. And that will enhance connection because I think the responsibility is for us how do we connect people and, you know, it, it, it's Pollyannish, but how do you sort of make people see what connects them instead of what divides them? Well, uh, this also makes me think about community to community organizers, right? That we have a stakeholders who may not know their interests align with one another yeah. and that it's not until some external threat is identified that they are forced to come together. But it's like, I guess, using the... Well, exact metaphor of pressure turning coal into a diamond that people find commonality and it's the job of the community organizer or the collaboration artist we use a different name is to help them surface the things they have in common so that they reduce social distance and are able to work together. Right. You know, one of the things that, that, that I'm trying to figure out with a group of people is how do you turn coffee shops into community centers uh, because all they're doing right now is selling coffees and they're, and they're in pretty much in every neighborhood known to man. How do you activate them? And instead of having a, um, selling just coffee that you have a collaboration artist or community organizer that, that can bring people to help solve the loneliness issue because the loneliness issue, mm -hmm. according to the surgeon generals and everyone else is still our, you know, one of our biggest, biggest problems in the world. And, uh, so, using these collaboration artist skills in a place that's, that just sells coffee that can be used as a mini community center, as opposed to putting billions of dollars against it could be a, a solution. So, I mean, the innovation is what has to happen. I think. And you're, and you're hmm. improving it is something that is needed. I mean, it makes it, that, that's a really interesting point too, because even Howard Schultz, when he was setting up Starbucks was you know, the idea of the third space, right? As this, the, that's what the, what the coffee shop could be. Um, but it's interesting because that idea both, I don't know if it dried up, but yeah, like it didn't, it never came to full fruition. And then I, I remember there was talk and pushback, um, from Apple when they were trying to make these, their stores that the, they were thinking about redesigning their stores as these, uh, these other kind of community spaces also, which is, which is interesting. There's more pushback against that. I think because it's a different thing to consume an iPad and it is a coffee, right? The, the price differential is insanely different, right? But, right. but like, what is the point? Like, do, do these, do these spaces have to be areas of consumption, right? And it was, was one of the, the kind of questions there too. And that's an interesting point because coffee shops are some of the few, uh, you know, kind of public stores that you can legally hang out in for a long time. Right. And like, that's an important part too. Like, do you have, cause I think the other interesting piece of serendipity too, is like, there's a time element, right? Like it can happen quickly, but also it can happen if you're there longer too. Right. There's more time to connect with other yeah. people. Yeah. Um, so I think coffee shops are a really interesting spot poised to, to help us rethink that um, as an area that, that could take place as kind of public spaces. Um but imagine even combining, like if they're, imagine or, combining yeah. that with a collaboration artist or community organizer that can say, okay, we're going to do uh, a Jeffersonian style like discussion with the people to solve a problem and you're invited. And someone just asking someone else to do something, you know, especially in poor neighborhoods uh, where they have nothing else that there's almost like a, a camp counselor or a type of person that, that you want to go connect with. Uh, or you want to, uh, there's a problem that needs to be solved and we need to have a discussion here and really micro it. You don't need a billion dollar solution. Um, you need mm -hmm. to think about more simple things. Yeah. And it's, that's a good point. I mean, connection is free, right? You know, connection it's something that we can, we can do. Um, yeah. So I think, uh, I think ultimately, yeah, it's like, I really, I really appreciate the idea of a collaboration artist uh, as to me, highlighting the the fact and you kind of point this out in the book too that like there isn't there's an art to it that it's something that we can all do um and and most people admire some artist of some kind whether it's a musician or a painter sculptor you know creator yeah. um, because there's a creative aspect of art too and so i think this is like the nice nice moment that it's not just an art of producing something but it's about creating these these spaces connections and opportunities and so there's uh you know a, a, a nice generative quality i think that 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 sits with me in terms of 
how can we help bring out our own inner artists? Um, and the collaboration connection is the thing that we're creating yeah. um, together, I think is, is really powerful. It's interesting. I, I've been sort of preaching this for the last 10 years and it's become sort of like, I just made the name up and all of a sudden others mm -hmm. are, are, you know, how things sort of, sort of, you have to keep saying them over and over again to get people to understand them. And as you know, I believe that Ben Parr talks about, you need to create, you have to have a lot of kindling to create a bonfire. And uh, mm -hmm. the idea is that if you keep spreading this around and you have a mission to sort of take a very simple concept because we're sparking movements uh, Sarah Brown, who's in the book, uh, was the wife of the former prime minister of England. And she taught me all about never get too in-depth in a nonprofit, but you have to spark the movements if you're at a level that you can do stuff. Right. And she's the mm -hmm. White Ribbon Foundation, and she's involved in uh, – her husband and uh, she are involved in uh, bringing uh, elementary education to the world through the UN Millennial Goals, Millennium, millennium Goals. And um, – and sparking movements is a really important thing. And you have to do simple things and say them over and over again, even though it bores the hell out of you. Mm -hmm. You just described my yeah. life in teaching. <laughs> <laughs> Every single day. I'm like, didn't we already talk about this? I guess I'll have to say it again. It's Groundhog's Day. <laughs> over and over. Re hopefully with repetition, it penetrates. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. And it's the same, I think it's the same thing here. It's reawakening the things that are essential to who we are, but we've forgotten in society especially in modern society. And I was, you know, I closing with sociology started with the alienation that was brought on by the change from agricultural society to industrial society. You know, it's society often divorces us from ourselves and it's how do we get back in connection with who we are as social people, despite all of these social forces and technological forces that exist that try to convince us otherwise. You guys are amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am so blown away by, uh, you know, I I don't get to talk to people that are practitioners in this. I'm just doing this out of sheer, like, it seems obvious to me. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> me too. It's like, why can't we, you know, it's, someone, someone, you know, told me before sociology is like, you know, the science of the obvious to which I just respond, well, if it's so obvious and how come no one's doing it? <laughs> and as sociologists, mm -hmm. anthropologists, and we're both practitioners, we have to become better at communicating. And that's what your book does so well is that through the stories, it communicates this in ways that people mm. can understand and get inspired by. And that's where I think both of our fields have to do a better job of connecting what it is we know to what it is people can do and should be doing. That's fabulous. Thank you. That's great. Well, thanks so much, David. It was really, you. really appreciate it and really appreciate the book and appreciate all you're doing with collaboration artists. It's fantastic work. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Anything I can do for you guys or your cause, let me know. I'm all in. I'm, this is like the thing that gives me the goosebumps about you know living. So mm -hmm. it's really important. We'd like to thank David Adler for joining us again on the podcast. And David is the chair and founder of BizBash and the author of Harnessing Serendipity. And we're happy to have him to talk about the importance of connection and creating communities across context. A lot of C's right there. A lot of C's. And as always, you can find out more about David and his work in our show notes. And as always, folks, we'd love to hear from you. So hop in the conversation with us. Have you ever hosted or been a part of a Jefferson Jeffersonian dinner party? Uh, again, I think it's an interesting idea that we, we should uh, we should maybe play with some more. And also, how can organizations create a spirit of generosity for interacting with others, such as sharing resources and ideas more freely? This is something that really stuck with me from the conversation. But I'm also kind of wondering, you know, how possible is this in today's day and age? You know, is it more of a utopian ideal or can we actually make it happen? I think so. But what do you think? Shoot us a message as always at feedback at experiencexdesign.com or hop in the conversation on our LinkedIn page. Yes, there were a lot of C words there, but none of the bad C words. That's true. Okay. That's, okay. that's because we're recording professionals. And if you want to be with us as recording professionals, you can always link, reach out to us at feedback at experiencexdesign.com and talk about how you too can be in the presence of recording professionals who only use the good C words in their show closings. And yeah. if you have ideas for shows, make sure you send feedback as well or other C words you'd like us to talk about. And as always, we want to thank you for your support, for your ongoing listening, for all of your wonderful comments and the not so wonderful comments. We welcome those too. And we hope to see you next time on Experience by Design Podcast. 